John Riggy Sr., also known as John the Eagle, was born in 1925 in New Jersey. He would reside most of his life in the Linden section of northern New Jersey and would finish out his years at a small home in the town of Edison. He was the son of an original member of the Brigada named Emmanuel Manny Riggy. John himself would also welcome several sons to join him in the life. Vincent, Emmanuel, and John Jr. would all become inducted soldiers under their father's guidance. Riggy's activities included union racketeering, shakedowns and labor extortion, shylocking, gambling, and by virtue of his longtime position as a capo regime and eventually boss of the entire family, Riggy would have his hand in every racket engaged in by his rank and file. He was inducted very early in his career, with his father Manny sponsoring his membership. He served for years as a loyal soldier active in street rackets until being tapped by Sam DeCalvacante himself in early 1965 to serve as a business agent for local number 394, Hod Carriers and Common Laborers Union, AFL-CIO, based in Elizabeth. He would later rise up to be the business manager, essentially the top controlling position of a labor union, holding this post for over 22 years until 1987. In 1986, he was also appointed president of LIUNA District Council 30 in Union County, New Jersey. Side note, in 1987, Riggy would be indicted on labor extortion and subsequently removed from all union offices. But before he was, Riggy had installed numerous family members and mob associates over the years in cushy jobs as key union officials and office staff. The De Cavacante's domination over local number 394 and its affiliated labor union entities would be total and complete. For example, Emmanuel Manny Riggy, John's son and a family soldier, was appointed director of LIUNA Building and Training Center in Jamesburg, New Jersey. A De Cavacante Capo di Decina became the auditor for local number 394. A mob associate and relative of a family capo was appointed business manager of the Laborers Welfare Fund of Union County, New Jersey. Riggy's wife was appointed the clerk of the local number 394 pension fund. And Riggy's father Manny had been an official of this union years prior, before he too was removed for impropriety. Riggy took over the position from former union official Joseph Joe Tiger Safira, who had previously served in that post and oversaw all union rackets for De Cavacante. Safira had been ousted by the boss for his mismanagement of the local because he had not performed to De Cavacante's satisfaction. Safira had ignored repeated requests by Sam to keep all friends of theirs gainfully employed at ongoing construction projects. Sam was also dismayed and had been embarrassed in front of New York boss Carlo Gambino by Safira's refusal to keep Gambino family Amico Nostri and other New York-based mob associates in good paying and easy lift construction jobs as promised by Sam. At the same time, Sam also advised Riggy that he was being bumped up to a captain's position, that which had been previously held by Safira. So for John, it was a double kiss, and for Joe Safira, it was a double kick in the ass. Safira was promptly notified by the boss that for his insubordination, he was being demoted down to a soldier post and would lose his lofty labor union job. Sam advised Joe Safira not to show his face anymore at the union hiring hall and to make himself scarce, that he was still a member in good standing and would be respected, but that it was best if Safira heeded the advice to keep himself in check and not cause any more trouble, or he would suffer consequences. After that meeting with his family boss, Joseph the Tiger Safira went out the door, reduced to a pussycat. He was reported to have become so emotional at the bad news that he started to cry in front of Sam, confirming for De Calvacante the unstable nature of his former capo. From that day forward, John Riggy's underworld stock would go up tenfold, and Riggy would never look back. 
John the Eagle would soar into the mafia sky. It seemed he could do no wrong in Sam the Plumber's eyes. After DiCavacante was indicted on federal gambling charges and subsequently convicted and jailed for five years for heading a huge $25 million a year policy betting network with over 50 operatives, Riggy was tapped to act in his boss's stead while Sam served his federal jail bid. John Riggy became the official underboss of the entire Borgata and served as Sam's eyes and ears on the street. After Sam was granted parole, he wisely chose to relocate from the mob hotbed of New Jersey down to the tranquil, quieter South Florida area. And although De Cavacante would maintain his official position as a capo familia, he named John as the day-to-day -day official acting boss of the family. This gave Riggy unprecedented powers within Cosa Nostra. He was now in the top post of his organization and on equal footing to such men of the era as Frank Thierry, Paul Castellano, Anthony Corallo, Carmine Persico, and Carmine Galante. Riggi was already a much respected leader by the DiCavacante rank and file membership, and he had had enough interaction over the years with the top powers of the New York families that he was immediately recognized and sanctioned as the accepted representante of the New Jersey Borgata. Riggi's power base soon extended from the Brigada's humble Lyndon Elizabeth headquarters through the entire state of New Jersey. He would soon also flex his muscles within metropolitan New York, especially the Brooklyn and Queens areas and the western sector of Connecticut, including Waterbury and Bridgeport, where the family had always maintained a presence, operating an 8 to 10 member regime captained by the La Selva brothers and their associates. During these early years, Riggi also backed the redesign and subsequent brand new construction of what had always been the family's de facto headquarters, the Ribera Club, a private members-only social club that the Brigada had utilized over the years as their home base. A beautiful, professional, architecturally designed brick multi-level structure was erected on the site of their former social club. Upon completion, a formal ribbon-cutting ceremony was conducted by a very proud De Cavacante membership. As a side note, many of the Brigada's inducted membership, as well as their closer associates, originally hailed from the Sicilian town of Ribera, and whether born there or bloodlines traced to Ribera, there is tremendous pride to their common bond. While he was in power, John Riggi's closest associates over the years included Samuel Sam the Plumber de Cavacante, boss since 1964. Sam trusted Riggi as his proxy, becoming Sam's eyes and ears with the membership. Emmanuel Manny Riggi, an original highly respected elder who proposed his son for induction. Manny had been a business agent with local number 394 from 1946 to 1958 before being ousted and banned for labor law violations. Frank Big Frank Majuri, Sam's former longtime underboss, later eased into a consigliere position as he aged. Majuri had gained notoriety as an attendee at the infamous 1957 mob barbecue at Joe Barber's estate at Appalachian, New York. Vincent Jimmy the Gent Rotundo, a top capo who oversaw the New York membership and later became Riggi's underboss, longtime power and organizer in local number 1814 International Longshoremen's Union. Stephen, the truck driver, Vitabali, would become consigliere for 35 years after Majuri and a close aide to Riggi. Later, after Riggi was imprisoned, Stephen, the truck driver, served to hold the Brigada together. Luciano Fat Louis Larasso, top veteran and highly respected capo who held lots of influence. His perceived power would later get him killed. He attended the 1957 Appalachian meeting with Majuri. Paul Castellano, Gambino Boston equal, in theory, to Riggi. 
They would do a lot of deals together over the years before Paul's murder. It is believed that Paul represented Riggy before the commission. Carmine Jr. Persico, Colombo boss. His administration would maintain close relations with Riggy's Jersey crew. They also allegedly shared some South Florida rackets together. Girolamo Jimmy Palermo, a New Jersey-based capo and Riggy confidant. He oversaw gambling operations in South Jersey for the family. Samuel Cavano, a labor union official of LIUNA Local No. 526 and the regional manager for the New York, New Jersey region of LIUNA, a close Riggy associate with whom he was in cahoots with in labor rackets. His son, David, and nephew, Daniel, would rise to head these union entities in later years as his key assistants. Joseph LaSala, a low-key Elizabeth, New Jersey-based soldier who partnered with Riggy in a sports bookmaking network and was a former official of Local No. 394. Salvatore Little Sal Timpani, another New Jersey soldier and close Riggy aide. He was later indicted and jailed with the boss in a labor extortion case. Paolo Paul Farina, a long-serving New Jersey-based capo trusted by Riggy to help run the laborers' union number 394 and an extortionist. Joseph Jake Coletti, an Elizabeth, New Jersey-based soldier who controlled Union County rackets for Riggy. Jake was also a union official with local number 394. John Riggy was a strong boss, firm in his dictates, but reportedly fair with his rank and file soldiers and capos. He was a well-liked leader, held their respect, and was treated as an equal by the other New York City bosses. This pretty much gave the DiCavacante crew a good position to operate unimpeded for years. In later years, Riggy would run head-on into the heavy-handed style of John Gotti. The once mutually respectful friendship and affiliation enjoyed by Sam DiCavacante in his interaction with both Carlo Gambino and his cousin and successor Paul Castellano became a thing of the past. In short order, with his ascension to boss, Gotti, with his insecurity and ego on full display, started making demands of Riggy and the DiCavacantes, and it seems that Riggy was intimidated by Gotti and his minions. Regardless of whether he was actually threatened or just felt threatened, he folded like an accordion, and the results were telling. In 1988, Gotti was suspected of having ordered the murder of Jimmy Rotundo, at that time, Riggy's powerful New York-based underboss. At the subsequent wake held for Rotundo in Brooklyn, Gotti was said to have showed up with an entourage of 20 hoodlums in an intentional and intimidating show of force. Within a few minutes of exchanging pleasantries, Gotti ordered Riggy into the funeral parlor side room. They would not emerge for over an hour. Upon exiting the office, it was said that John Riggy looked like he had just seen a ghost. Later that evening, in a conference with his key men, who had mostly all attended the wake, Riggy made the fateful announcement that from that night forward, the DiCavacante family would run under the supervision of the Gambino family, basically making them subservient as a family within a family or a glorified crew instead of a separate borgata. So this proud, 40-member, Elizabeth-based family, established for nearly 70 years, with another 200 years thrown in for good measure, counting their Ribera Sicily origins, had their balls cut off by John Gotti, the upstart boss of the 250-member Gambino crew. Is there any doubt that Gotti was hated by many mafiosi in the New York, New Jersey underworld? This was one example of many violent and threatening incidents as Gotti attempted to assert his domination over perceived weaker associates of various crews in the New York Mafia. John Riggy would eventually be indicted, convicted, and jailed in 1990 on wide-ranging federal RICO labor rackets charges, which brought him a 12-year prison term. 
Reagan made arrangements for the smooth succession of union leadership by installing his close associate and confidant Jerome Corsentino as president of Local No. 394. Jerome Corsentino was a relative of Carlo Corsentino, a longtime veteran soldier of the Borgata. An interesting side note is that the Corsentino family ran a well-established funeral home by the same name that had been a De Cavacante family asset for decades. It is mob lore that Carmelo Corsentino, the father, had been the innovator of the double-decker coffin, an ingenious underworld invention where two bodies were fit into one coffin through a false-bottomed coffin. While in prison serving his sentence, Riggi was again indicted on a second federal case brought by the FBI, who had turned Riggi's son-in-law, Sean Richard. Working in an undercover capacity for the feds and wearing a wire, this piece of garbage duly recorded his father-in-law and numerous mafiosi and several New York families, corrupt union officials and businessmen, in incriminating conversations discussing shakedowns, labor union kickbacks and extortion, and various other labor racketeering violations of federal law. More dominoes would soon start to fall. Within several years' time, another major case, and a body, was literally dropped at the mob boss's doorstep. Riggy was alleged by the FBI of ordering the murder of Fred Weiss, the editor of a local newspaper named the Staten Island Advance, who doubled as a corrupt businessman and real estate developer. This contract killing was supposedly orchestrated as a favor to Gambino mob boss John Gotti. Weiss had been partners with several wise guys in a Staten Island landfill they had purchased and were using as an illegal dump for medical waste. After the FBI started an investigation into the scheme and Weiss had been subpoenaed to give testimony, Gotti felt he was weak and had turned informant. He requested that Riggi have a De Cavacante hit team dispose of the potential problem. It was the FBI's theory, and later confirmed by on-site informants, that from his prison cell, John Riggi gave the order for his minions to coordinate what would turn out to be a high-profile, daytime gangland hit on the corrupt newspaper man. One September day, Capo regime Vincent Viniotion Palermo and soldier Anthony Capo, in tandem with several other carloads of New Jersey mafiosi, set out in a caravan of stolen surveillance and crash vehicles to stalk their prey. Tracking their victim to his girlfriend's condo, Palermo and Capo left their auto and set upon Weiss as they exited the building. They emptied their pistol clips into his face and body as he attempted to enter his parked car. It was over in seconds. Mission accomplished. Several years later, Riggi was also accused of complicity in the 1992 murder of John D'Amato, another high-level member who the De Calvicante administration, Riggi included, were accused of killing for two major indiscretions. One was for attempting to seize the boss seat without an approved family vote, and the more embarrassing accusation that D'Amato was a closet homosexual. Riggi was alleged to have signed off on his killing. Side note, John D'Amato was alleged to have been encouraged and pushed by Gotti as his hand-picked choice to lead the family, giving Gotti de facto control over the DeCalvacantes through his puppet boss, D'Amato. There had been others clipped through the years that were attributed to Riggi as well by his giving a thumbs-down Roman style, including John Serrato in 1978, associate Joey Garifano in 1989, and veteran one-time underboss Louis LaRosso in 1991, to name a few. And this didn't include any additional murder conspiracies that for one reason or another were never carried out. As the dominoes fell for the De Cavacante Borgata, several key members and associates jumped ship to Team America. First they were the Hunters, then the Hunted. In addition to Sean Richard was family captain Anthony Rotundo, Jimmy Rotundo's son, acting boss Vincent Palermo, soldier Anthony Capo, 
and proposed associates Victor Di Chiera and Frank Scarabino. There were others, too, all of them flipping, pointing a damning finger from the witness stand in federal court, and then quietly slipping into the federal witness protection program. In a plea agreement worked out with federal prosecutors, Riggi agreed to serve eight years and ten years more, respectively, to run concurrently for the Diamato and Weiss murders and various other racketeering counts. In short, John Riggi got buried. And he wasn't lonely for long. With the devastating testimonies of these informants, prosecutors soon brought down the entire house of Di Cavacante. Consiglier, Stephen the truck driver, underboss Charles Majuri, top capos Philip Abramo, Giuseppe Schifoletti, Rudolph Ferrone, and Girolamo Palermo, and various soldiers, including Louis Consalvo, Anthony Manorino, Virgil Alessi, Joseph Sclafani, James Gallo, Charles Stango, Gregory Rago, Frank Diamato, and Gaetano Vestola, among others, were soon indicted, tried, and convicted of multiple racketeering counts, murders, and various attempted murder conspiracies, and more. Practically all would be sentenced to serve long prison terms. John would serve over 22 years in federal prison without a complaint. He did his bid like the tough old bird and World War II veteran he was, with a quiet pride and resolve. Side note, during part of his prison stay, Riggi shared a cell and became close with infamous Sicilian Mafia chieftain Gaetano Tano Badalamente of the Pizza Connection fame. The two mafiosi representing either side of the Atlantic Ocean comforting each other in their waning days. Released from jail in 2012, Riggi passed away several years later in the comfort of his home with his loving family whom John had always doted on as a very loving dad, close by his side. After serving approximately 22 straight years in various federal lockups, John Michael Riggi Sr., also known as the Eagle, died at the ripe old age of 90 in August of 2015. The old mafioso was said to have served his time with his chin up and with a smile on his face like the man that he was. He had been the official, recognized representante of the New Jersey crew since at least 1980, maybe earlier, 35 years at the helm as the boss. And John had served variously as an underboss and acting boss to Sam the Plumber for at least five years before that. In truth, looking back on his underworld career, Riggy was one of the longest serving mafia bosses in underworld history, a fact many mob historians fail to notice. He ruled in a low-keyed fashion for many years, guiding his soldiers and key associates through some rough waters. Until the federal assault on all Cosa Nostra in the late 1980s, he and his brood had survived and thrived, but his time came, as it had for most all of his New York Mafia contemporaries, as it usually does. Today, the old Di Calvacante family of Elizabeth, New Jersey, is but a shell of its former self never a large brigada to begin with. At their height, they were said to have only a membership of 30 to 40 good fellas. The repeated assaults by law enforcement, key informants, and through sheer attrition over the years has whittled away at the once proud membership. They have hobbled along through a succession of interim acting leaders and panels comprised of whatever veteran members are left that they feel are capable enough to help lead them forward into the future, but their bench is getting very shallow. They are a far cry off from the days of Nicky Dell, Sam the Plumber, and John the Eagle, who I'm sure are rolling in their graves at what's become of their beloved Brigada. Thank you for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of Mob Fireside Chat presented by the Button Guys of the New York Mafia. And don't forget to comment and let us know your thoughts about John Riggi or any of our other mob tales. You can also visit thenewyorkmafia.com and indulge yourself in many more tales of the underworld. Until next time.